So this talk will be about uh, idempotent elements of finite semigroups. So there are several reasons to study idem idempotence in computer science. Here we will focus on uh, idempotence as a way to identify, given an abstract model, what are the behaviors of this abstract model that have good properties with respect to iteration. <laughs> so let's start with some basic definitions. What is a semigroup? So basically a semigroup is just a set with an associative binary low. And an idempotent element of a semigroup is just an element that is stable when multiplied by itself. Okay? So let's look at some examples. For example, any group is actually a semigroup. Mm -hmm. um, and what are the idempotent, idempotent elements of a group? Well, every group has a single idempotent, which is its identity element. Okay. But not all semigroups are groups. So for example, if you take the set, the max semigroup MN, which is the set of N integers with the max operation, well, this is clearly not a group. And um, what we can see in this particular semigroup is actually every element is an idempotent. If you take any I, the max between I and itself is, of course, itself. Okay. Some more examples that will be used throughout this talk are the set of functions over a finite number of elements uh, equipped with the composition. So here, uh, the idempotent, you have, yeah, you have several different idempotents. So it's not like uh, the max semigroup. Not everything is an, is an idempotent, but you still have a lot. So for example, the identity function is one, but you also have uh, every constant function that maps every element to the same element. Um, and many others. So yeah, basically you can kind of be combine these two ideas, be the identity in a subset of your domain and be the constant function in some other subsets and you still end up with some idempotence. Okay? And the last, last example uh, I will present is the set of binary relations over a finite number of elements. So this time, what are the idempotents? So one example would be the relation uh, smaller than or equal to. Um, so this is an idempotent. Uh, once again, there are several other idempotent elements. They are all partial orders, but not all partial orders is an idempotent. Yeah, don't care too much about that. There's a lot of them, but not, not. But of course, once again, not every element of um, of this set is an idempotent. Okay. So, how to use idempotent to identify iterable behavior? Well, let's start with the very basic model of computation. So, just an automaton. You have a finite number of states, transitions, labeled by letters, and you accept every word uh, for which you can go from an, an, an initial state to a final state. So, for example, here, AABBBB is accepted. And what you can notice is that here in the middle, we have what is called a loop. One state is repeated. So what does it mean? Well, actually, the part here can be iterated any number of times, and we're still in the language. OK? So yes, for finite state automata, loops are a great way to characterize iterable behavior, because, well, first, they can be iterated. Uh, I mean, uh, when we iterate the loop, yeah, we really iterate just this part. It's a very local change, so we don't modify other parts of the word, which is good. And on top of that, that loop are guaranteed to appear. As, as soon as you have a run that is uh, longer than your number of state, of course, a loop will, up, will happen somewhere. Okay? So loops are great for finite state automata. But uh, this does not work as well when we go to more complicated uh, models of computation. So for example, if you have a model that uses all of the runs to produce the input, uh, so for example, weighted automata or a universal automata, then the notion of loop is not that well. Because so either you say that you have a loop if at least one of your runs is looping, but then you cannot really iterate it, because what happens with the other run could be uh, totally chaotic. 
Or the other way to define a loop could be, yeah, I have a loop if and only if all of my runs are looping simultaneously, but then you cannot guarantee that such kind of loops will appear. So uh, we see that here, yeah, the notion of, of loop doesn't work that well. Uh, same thing wh when we have um, models of automata that read the input in a non-standard way. So for example, two-way transducers or uh, pebble automata. Uh, the problem is kind of the same here. So maybe the first time we go through a um, factor of our word, I will actually loop. But then if I come back later, I might do something else. So do I still consider this as a loop or not? And same thing, whatever I choose, either um, this will be th something that uh, might produce chaotic behaviors once iterated, or uh, I ask too much and I, and I have no guarantee that uh, this thing will appear. And finally, uh, the notion of loop also fails to work in mo models that have non-standard output production. So for example, uh, yeah, automata that produce their uh, that produce outputs with the use of registers, so cost registers, or automata, or streaming string transducer. And so, yeah, let's have a look um, in more details in this last case, in why it fails, uh, why loop fails to work. So here is an example of a um, cost register automata. I hope you can see, see it. So, yeah, how does it work? Well, it's like an automata, you read some letter and you have a finite number of registers that are updated along the computation. So here you have two, regist two registers, X and Y. Um, you see that first, uh, while going further um, in this automata, in this automaton, whenever you read an A, you increment X, and whenever you read a B, you increment Y. Yeah, sorry, I should have stated that. Your registers contain integers. So they start with value zero, and then, yeah, you apply some operation on, on them. So here you increment them. And finally, here you have a loop. You can read some Cs, and whenever you read a C, you put the value of Y into X, and you reset Y. So that's something uh, you can do. Uh, that's a cost register automaton. Let's have a look at a run. So if we have the word B, A, B, B, C, we start at the beginning with uh, registers, register values zero. We read the first B, so we increment Y. We read an A, we increment X, B, B, two more increments to the Y. And then when we read the C, we put the value of Y into X and we reset Y. So from one, three, we go to three, zero. Okay? But this is a loop, and we said before, yeah, loops are well behaved with respect to iteration, so let's add one more. And you see that here, obviously, it will fail, because if you iterate this one, once more, um, so you put the value of y into x and you reset y, so you end up putting the zeros into the x and reset, resetting y, so you lose everything. You lose all the, the computation done on your previous run. And so, yeah, this is terrible. This, uh, this is not a local change, and we would like to avoid that. So, yeah, are all loops terrible? Actually, no. Some of the loops can be iterated. So if we just change the, the register update on the last loop here, so instead of uh, the previous one, now I just sum up the um, content of both of my variables into x, and I reset y to the value 1. So what happens this time? Well, the beginning of the run is the same as before. I end up with a value of 1 into x and a value of 3 into y. And then when I read my C, so I sum them both in X and reset Y to 1. So I end up with 4, 1. And this time, if I choose to iterate this loop uh, even more, uh, what happens? So I sum them into X, I reset Y to 1. So in the end, I just add 1 to X. And we can see that if I keep doing that, I'll just keep adding 1 again and again to uh, the value of X. So yeah, this is what I consider as uh, well-behaved with respect to iteration. Uh -huh. And what we can remark here is that the structure of the register update here is actually an idempotent. So if we just forget about the, um, the integer numbers, and we just look at which variables end up in which variables, um, we see that, that we can uh, combine this with, with itself as many times as we want, we will always end up with x and y in, the, value, in uh, the variable x and no variable in the variable y, okay? 
And this is not a coincidence. Actually, we can show that whenever we have a register update that has an, in, an idempotent structure, uh, we will always have these nice uh, um, properties with respect to iteration that uh, if we iterate this, this um, variable update, register update, n plus one times, well, it will be kind of like if we have already uh, only iterated, if we have only applied it once, and then, yeah, we just add something that is fixed every single time. Okay? And actually, this is an if and only if. So this nice thing is also a characterization of um, sub uh, register up updates with idempotent structures. Okay. So, yes, let's go back to this slide. So I hope that I kind of convinced you that uh, idempotents are a nice way to look at uh, good iterable behavior for cost register automata. And yeah, it's also the case for some other models. I won't go into the details, but for example, um, so idempotent elements corresponding to the transition monoids of weighted automata, for example, ha have been studied here to expose some pumping lemmas. And here, uh, once again, you have some notion of uh, idempotent element for uh, two-way transducers, a uh, transition monoid of two-way transducers that have good properties with respect to iteration and that have been used to prove some other results. So in general, it seems like idempotent elements are well behaved with respect to iteration. Well, it's not always that trivial. You always need to try and think which kind of semi-group would be good to modelize your pro problem, which kind of, yeah, the, yeah. the problem is fin finding a finite semi-group to modelize uh, the thing you have, because basically you, you always have a, a trivial infinite semi-group, but the difficult part is, yeah, fi finding a finite one that still contains all the useful information. So, yes, we'll behave with respect to iteration. So the question that's left is, are these idempotent elements guaranteed to appear? The easy answer is yes. So one, uh, the most usual way of obtaining this result is uh, applying the forest factorization theorem that will give you that for free. I mean, if you have a run that is long enough, you will end up with uh, a nice structure with a lot of idempotents. But what I want to present right now is kind of a weaker version of the forest factorization theorem. And why is that interesting? Well, we'll see that uh, having a weaker version of this theorem allows us to get way better bounds uh, on the actual size of the runs we need to consider in some cases, okay? So yes, just before going further, one thing I should add is uh, yes, idempotent elements are well behaved with respect to iteration, but sometimes it's not enough to have a single idempotent element. Sometimes, yeah, actually for all of these two results, I think, um, you need several repetitions of the same idemp idempotent in a row. So uh, a bounded number of times. So like here it's two times or something, and here it depends on the number of states of your automaton. But um, but uh, yes, having a single, item, uh, uh, a single idempotent is sometimes not enough. Uh, you might need several of them. So this leads us to the following definition. So if we're given a sequence U of elements of a finite semigroup S, we say that a Ramsey lambda decomposition of U is just a sequence of consecutive factors of U that all correspond to the same idempotent. Let's have a look at an example. It might be easier to understand it with that. So here I have a sequence of element of the max semigroup M4. So remember, it's the semigroup on four elements. The product is just the max. Uh -huh. um, so for example, this is a Ramsey three decomposition. Why is that? Well, I have three factors. They are consecutive. And on top of that, the maximum in each of them is three. And as I said at the beginning, three is an idempotent element of this uh, semigroup. Okay. Uh, let's have another example. So uh, um, once again, a word uh, over the same semigroup. So this time we, 
this word actually does not admit any um, uh, any, any Ramsey 3 decomposition, but we can find here a small Ramsey 2 decomposition. Okay, both uh, the maximum are two. Okay, and so yeah, now the question I will try to ask uh, to ask is a good thing, but I want to answer it also. And the rest of this talk is um, how long does a sequence of elements needs to be? to guarantee the existence of uh, Ramsey lamb lambda decomposition, okay? So, yes, as I said to you earlier, uh, a way to answer to this question would be applying uh, the first factorization theorem. This will give you a bound, but uh, yes, what I would like, I mean, ideally, um, I would like to have something exact to know given a semigroup S, what is exactly the length of the, um, of the maximal sequence of elements of S that does not admit a Ramsey lambda decomposition, okay? And so yes, one more thing I, I should add before going further. So yeah, actually in the remainder of the talk, I will consider the case lambda equal two because it's easier to present the, the ideas of the proof in this way, but actually all the thing I, I will present now is easily generalizable to uh, any lambda. Okay, so let's continue. So yeah, first let's consider um, some easier cases. So first, what happens in groups? So here we actually have a tight bound. We can prove that, uh, so if we have a group G and we're given a sequence of element of G that is longer than two times twice the size of G, um, then this sequence admits a Ramsey decomposition. And on the other hand, we can prove that there exists a sequence that, well, has size just this minus one, and that does not ad admit any Ramsey to decomposition, okay? So how do we prove that? Well, let's start with the first. And uh, for this example, I will, con uh, yeah, I will prove uh, this in a very specific case, but as you will see, the proof is uh, easily generalizable. So I consider the cyclic group over five elements. So yeah, the sum, uh, the product, or here I will denote it with a plus, is just, well, uh, the class, the sum of two classes is the class of the sum modulo five, okay? Okay, so. If I'm given a word of size two times, twice the size of, of G, so here, 10, uh, how, do I exp how do I find a uh, Ramsey to, to decomposition? Well, it's by considering the sequence of prefixes. So what do I mean by that? Well, I just compute the sequence with which corresponds to the prefixes of U. So I start, yeah, I start with a zero. This kind of corresponds to the empty prefix, and then I just write the element that corresponds to every prefix. So here I have a three, so it's just three. Here three plus four is seven, which is two modulo five. Uh, plus three, I end up back with zero, and I continue that way, okay? Okay, and so this thing, uh, since I added an element corresponding to the empty prefix, the length of this sequence will be one more than the previous one. So this will be strictly more than twice the size of G. And so I know for sure that one element will be repeated three times, okay? Since the length is more than twice the size, one element is repeated three times. And what's good about that? Well, since I'm in a group, actually, identical element of this sequence of prefixes uh, correspond to neutral factor, factors of U. So if I consider here the the factors that are between these identical elements of the prefix sequence, well, they are actually the neutral element, which is an idempotent. And so here, I directly get my uh, Ramsey to decomposition. Okay? Okay. Perfect. So, no, so, and um, yes, I mean, this works here with this precise group, but this works exactly the same with any other group. And so, what about the the other, the lower bound. So how, how do we construct a sequence uh, of twice the size of G minus one that admits no Ramsey decomposition? Well, we only use the, the fact that this is actually an equivalence. So 
we begin by a prefix sequence and we construct u out of it. Uh, which pre prefix sequence do we choose? Well, just any prefix, prefix sequence that contains two times every element. So yeah, the important thing is that no element appears three times. So that if afterwards we just compute the word that corresponds to this prefix sequence, well, here the word, oh, sorry, the word is not that interesting. But uh, the thing is, um, uh, since here we have an equivalence, we know that we will never have two consecutive neutral factors of u because this would correspond to three times the same element here and we don't have that. Okay? So yeah, once again, this works exactly the same for any group. So this concludes the proof of this theorem here. Okay, so... That's a good start. In the case of groups, we have a bound that is tight. Good. Now, let's look at something else. Max semigroups. So remember, it's uh, mn is the integers from 1 to n, and the operation is the max. So once again, here, we have a bound that is tight. We prove that whenever the sequence is longer than 2 to the n, then there exists a Ramsey decomposition, and uh, on the other hand, there exists a sequence of length 2 to the n minus 1 that has no uh, Ramsey, two, Ramsey 2 decomposition. So, uh, once again, I will uh, present the proof on a very precise example. So here I fix uh, n equal 4, but it's generalizable to anyone. Uh, yeah, just to, re uh, rem to remember that uh, this is the product. So how does the proof work? Well, it's just a basic divide and conquer algorithm. So if I start with a sequence of elements of M4, which has size 2 to the 4, I just split it in two equal parts, okay? And then I look at the maximum in both of the parts. So here it's 4, here it's 4. Okay, I got lucky. So here I'm done. I already have my um, Ramsey 2 decomposition, okay? Uh, now, what happens if it's not the case? So for here I take an, a new one, same thing, it's a, a sequence of M4 and of size 2 to the 4. I split it in two parts. This time, one has max 4 and the other has max, max 3. The thing is, well, uh, if I keep the smaller one, since the max is not 4, I know that it does not contain any 4, okay? So it's actually an element, it can actually be considered as an element of M3. And since I had just divided the size, the initial size by 2, uh, its size is 2 to the 3. So yeah, by induction, uh, this seems good. So let's have a look what happens if I continue. Uh, here I split it in two. The max is 2, the max is 3. I keep the smallest one. Now I have something of M2, which we, whose size is 2 to the 2. Uh, I split it in two. The max is distinct, I keep the smaller one, and finally, when I'm down to M1, well, then I'm bound to have my 2 decomposition because the only, element of, uh, the only element of M1 is 1, okay? So, yes, of course, sometimes... Uh, so here are the two examples, once it stopped at the very beginning and once it stopped at the, the very end, but sometimes, yeah, you just stop in the middle. For example, here, um, you find uh, another... Uh, Ramsey 2 decomposition in the middle. Okay. And so, yes, that's all for this algorithm, I think. Yes. And so now, how do we construct, um, uh, to prove the lower bound, how do we construct a sequence of element of mn with, with size 2 to the n minus 1 and no Ramsey 2 decomposition? Uh, it's a basic indu inductive construction. So we start with u1, which is just a single one. Then to construct the ne next one, well, we take two copies of the previous one and we add the, the new element in the middle. And so w why does this not admit any Ramsey 2 decomposition? Well, we know that Ramsey 2 decomposition needs two factors. So here, since there is a single 2, we know that, I mean, 2 cannot be into both factors. So both factors need to be just 1, but then they cannot be consecutive because there is a 2 in the middle. 
And the idea is the same uh, for the rest. Uh, U3, I take two copies of, of U2, and I put a three in the middle. Once again, uh, three cannot be in both factors, so either the two factors are to the left of the three, or the two factors are to the right of the three. And uh, as we just proved, it's not possible to have two uh, consecutive idempotent factor in this, in this word, so this has no RAMC to decomposition, and so on. Okay? So in general, yes. We construct two, U, UN by putting a cop one copy of N in the middle of uh, two copies of UN minus one. Okay. So for groups, we have a tight bound. For max semigroups, we also have a tight bound. Unfortunately, yes, that's where it stops. Uh, for a, a more complicated uh, semigroups, I mean, no tight bound is known yet, and it seems kind of complicated to get one. But so how can we try to approximate it? Well, by introducing a parameter of semigroups called the regular J-length. So what is the regular J-length? Basically, it's the answer to the question, what is the biggest max semigroup that fits in my semigroup? OK, so formally, we say that this regular J-length is the largest integer n such that mn is a subsemigroup of S. OK? Alternatively, we can define that as um, the size of the largest chain of regular J-classes classes of S. Uh, but since I guess not everyone here is familiar with Green's relation, I think this, um, this uh, definition is a bit easier. Uh, yes, and just for the rest of the talk, I will sometimes also speak, I mean, I will sometimes compare the regular J-length with the J-length. So yes, regular J-length is really the size of the largest chain of regular J-classes of S, and J-length is just the size of the largest chain of any kind of J-classes -class of S. Okay. And so what's about this regular, uh, yeah, so first, what does this regular J-length uh, look like for uh, the semigroups semi we had as examples? So for example, in the max semigroup, uh, yeah, and I will compare the size of the semigroup with its regular J-length. So for the max semigroup, its size is n, and of course, the biggest mn that fits into mn is mn itself, so its regular J-length is also n. Mm -hmm. For a group, well, its size depends on the group, of course. And its regular J-length is only one. Because uh, in order to fit M2 in a group, we would need two distinct idempotent elements. And as we already said, groups have a single idempotent element. So the regular J-length of a group is one. Uh, what about functions? So the size of, um, so yeah, remember, Fn is the set of functions over n element equipped with composition. So it's partial functions, so yeah, that's why you have an n plus one factorial. And uh, the regular J length is n plus one. I won't prove that. Uh, it's a classical result. I mean, yeah, this uh, semigroup has, the Green's relation of this semigroup has been well studied. So n plus one factorial. Uh, did I make a mistake? The idea is that for every element, you choose its image amongst the n element or nothing, since we have partial functions. Yeah, yeah no, sorry, it's uh, not a factorial at all. It's, uh, it's um, n plus one to the n, yes. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Uh, okay. Okay, and what about uh, the semigroup of relations over n element? So here I think the size is 2 to the n squared. I hope I haven't done a mistake here. Um, and its regular j length is this thing, which looks kind of curious. So the proof that this is the regular j length of uh, this semigroup is kind of complicated, so I won't try to give an idea here. Um, 
but maybe I can try and say why it's uh, surprising in some sense. The thing is, so, so yes, um, I told you before the, uh, about the difference between the regular J length and the J length. So computing the J length of uh, R n is an open problem, has been open for quite a while, if I'm not uh, mistaken. It is known to be super polynomial, and you have some exponential bounds, uh, upper bounds. And so, yeah, I find it kind of sur surprising that, uh, I, I mean, it's not that incredible, but still, that when you actually drop the J classes that are not regular, uh, you end up with something that is polynomial, uh, whereas initially you were Super polynomial, okay? So that's all about that. Yeah, some more things about this regular J length. Uh, it has nice properties. So for example, if you have an injective semigroup homomorphism, well, uh, the J length goes in the way you expect it to be. <laughs> and same thing for a surjective, um, su surjective homomorphism, okay? And if you take the J-length of uh, the regular J-length of um, a direct product, well, it's just the sum of the regular J-length. And so, yeah, once again, these properties here, they are not true for the J-length. Uh, you can have semigroups, uh, sub-semigroups of your semigroup that have a bigger J-length than the semigroup itself. For the regular J-length, it's not possible because of that. If you, you take a sub-semigroup, you're regular J length has to be decreasing. Okay. And so, now that I introduced uh, this uh, notion of J length, I can finally uh, define uh, my main theorems. So it's about this Ramsey two decomposition in a general case. And so, what we can prove is that well, if we are longer than this thing, we have a Ramsey 2 decomposition. So let's have a closer look at what this thing here, th this thing is. So yes, at the exponent, we have twice the regular J length plus one. And here the base is twice the, the size of our sub, -sub semigroup squared. Okay. And well, this is not tight at all, unfortunately, but still, I mean, we still have that, it seems like the exponential behavior is really determined by this regular J length. So the gap is still huge, but at least we kind of identify what happens at the exponent, okay? So yeah, I won't do the full proof, uh, proofs of this theorem, but I will at least give you an idea. Well, actually for theorem two, we, I can do the full proof because we already did it in some sense. Uh, this is a trivial consequence of the lower bound for the MN case. Um, since the regular J length is defined as the biggest uh, MGS that is inside of S, well, we just take this isomorphism and we construct it exactly as we did before uh, by starting with one and then copying it and put, putting a single times the next one in between. Okay. So yeah, this is a direct consequence of the previous one. This is more complicated, but basically uh, the algorithm that constructs a Ramsey to decomposition of such a sequence is obtained by just combining the two algorithm I presented to you earlier. So what's the idea? So if you start with a sequence that has size, two size of S squared to the N plus one, what you do first, you compute, so before, in the case of a group, we just computed the prefix sequence. Now, we actually, we actually need both the prefix and the suffix sequence. Um, since uh, the prefixes can take, at most, size of s different values, same, thi same thing for the suffixes, um, these two sequences allows us to show that there is this number of consecutive factors that preserve a prefix and a suffix. So yeah, basically this is just that divided by size of S squared, corresponding to yeah, one suffix, one prefix, one suffix. Uh, once you have all these consecutive factors, well, you just split them into two parts. 
So yeah, each part has the size this divided by two. If both parts correspond to the same idempotent, we're done. We have a RAM set to decomposition, so we're happy. And if it's not the case, I just keep one part and I start over again. So uh, n here decreased by one. So yeah, from n plus one, I went to n. Uh, yeah, here I say keep one part. Actually, you cannot keep whatever, but defining which part to choose would be complicated. I mean, it's just technical. It's not actually not complicated at all, but yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, I guess you can understand this algorithm uh, based on what I explained earlier. What is not that trivial is why does this work? Well, actually, we can prove that it ends in at most this number of steps. And since we, we started, uh, so yeah, so if we start with a U that actually, for which N is actually twice the, twice the regular J length of S, well, we will, the algorithm will stop while we are, we still have a size high enough to, uh, to iterate the algorithm, kind of, yes. Okay, so that's the idea. And that is all for the proof of this theorem. So yeah, let me state once again my, my two main theorems. So we just proved them. And yeah, I can also add this uh, theorem about the regular G length. I mean, uh, so yeah, I really f think this is interesting and kind of surprising. So I also think it's the main theorem of this talk. And um, so, yes, what should I add? Um, yeah, what should you remember of this talk? Well, if you want to find some iterable uh, behavior, idempotents are a great way to look at. But then if you want to actually find some idempotents, factorization for a theorem is the best, of course. But uh, if, we, if you don't need the full power of the factorization for a theorem, and if you're actually interested uh, in optimizing the complexity of your algorithm, uh, thinking with the regular G length might sometimes actually be better. Okay, so that's all for my talk.